Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dina Tambuya. I'm one of the assistant professors in the Department of Hospitality. Uh, and I'm very pleased to introduce today uh, Adam uh, Tanner. Um, he's a fellow at the Institute for Quantitative Social Science at Harvard University, where he was previously a fellow, uh, a Neiman Fellow. And uh, he has worked for Reuters uh, news agency uh, for different, uh, in different countries, uh, Serbia, uh, well, and some uh, um, places, Berlin, Moscow, Washington, DC. And he also contributes to um, Forbes and other magazines. Uh, Adam Tanner writes about the business of personal data and his most uh, recent book, uh, What Stays in Vegas, The World of Personal uh, Data, Lifeblood of uh, Big Business and the End of Privacy as We Know It. Uh, in this book, uh, Adam explores the wild west of data capture and all the ways our, our personal information is driving commerce, whether we know it or not. So this is what uh, Adam will be talking about uh, today, casinos and gambling and the tales of entrepreneurial genius, uh, deceit, lust and crime in the multi-billion dollar business of personal information. So uh, please join me in welcoming Adam Tanner. Thank you for coming to La Salle. I'm still looking at a map. 10.07, I ask for directions from a passerby. 
this is the level of detail that the secret police were following me about this uh, single day. Now, uh, another interesting footnote to note about Dresden in that year, 1988, and that is the most famous ever KGB agent was stationed there, a the junior uh, spy, and that was Vladimir Putin, who is the uh, Russian president today. As far as I know, though, he was not on my case that day. And so the question is, why would 10 Stasi agents be following me around and monitoring my activity over the course of the day? Well, I was writing this, a travel by book that covers Eastern Europe and Yugoslavia on $25 a day. Now, I tell you this story in the beginning of my presentation um, as a contrast with the world of data gathering today. Now, today, 70% of what the Stasi was doing about me was um, it's just carrying around a cell phone, locational activity. Where are you at any point of the day? Um, and the techniques and the information that commercial people know about you, data brokers and your favorite companies, is far more extensive than even the secret police that even the stars knew about me at the time. Now, I've come to know all of this because over time I've investigated the companies that gathered data. I myself, as a reporter for many years, used some of these uh, dossiers that are available about all sorts of Americans. And I'll tell you one instance to give you an example of how this works. So this is former U.S. President Gerald Ford took over after Richard Nixon um, uh, when Nixon resigned. Now, I was working in California as the bureau chief for Reuters. <laughs> In 2006, Gerald Ford, we sent out an obituary. I was trying to think of what more could I say about Gerald Ford the next morning for a second day story. Um, and I thought, well, it would be interesting to find this man. I don't know if this face is still familiar to anyone all these years later, but this is Gerald Ford. Uh, this is uh, Chevy Chase. Now, 40 years ago, this year started the first season of Saturday Night Live. And Saturday Night Live back in the first season typically began with Don Pardo's voice saying, the President of the United States, Gerald Ford. And Chevy Chase would come out and he would not with any accent, not with any, um, not with any makeup or any presentation, but just pretending to be a complete double of clutch. And he said, he would say things like, I have two points to make. And and then he would say, here's my papers, and he would, fold, he would have them, and then he would finally trip over something, and he would begin the show uh, live from New York at Saturday night. Now, this comic impersonation of Gerald Ford was so strong in the 1970s that many people came to believe that Gerald Ford, uh, who was an athlete in college and was a very able person, was in fact a bumbler, uh, so he could barely uh, go on a, a, a stairway without falling down. So I thought, let me use the that Gerald Ford has died, thank you, and ask, whoa, that's much better, um, and ask, well, what, uh, what did you know about, uh, you know, did you meet, did you meet uh, Gerald Ford, what were your uh, impressions, and so on. So I wanted to find him, um, and so I looked in a data broker's file, and the reason I did this is that if you want to reach a celebrity as a journalist, you typically have to go through an agent, a lawyer, some kind of handler, and if they don't have a project to promote, it's very hard to get to them. So I looked in this dossier about um, various people to see if I can find a home number for Chevy Chase. I couldn't find his number, but I found a number that I thought belonged to his wife, and I called it up. And I said, um, here's what I'm doing. I'd like to talk to Chevy Chase. And she said, well, I'm not actually Mrs. Chase. I'm Chevy Chase's daughter. But it turns out I'm with my dad right now. We're on, we're on top of a mountain in Colorado because we're going skiing. So if you wait 30 minutes, he'll call you back. So, they're, they're going down the slopes. Uh, 30 minutes later, Chevy Chase calls, and I have a very nice interview with him, and he tells me about the time he met Gerald Ford, and they spent the day in Michigan, and uh, what a genial man he was. So all is fine. I send out the, the story on the Reuters wire, and everyone's interested in it, and so on. And then that evening, the phone rings again, and it's the comic actor Chevy Chase. And he says, listen, I've been thinking about this. How the hell did you get my daughter's cell phone number? And it was in this moment that I realized it doesn't matter if you are a celebrity or a sports star or a judge or if you work in a prison or whatever activity you may do, there are commercial companies gathering intimate details about you. And you have no real say about it or little say about it. And so Chevy said, che said look, I'm just some guy who made fun of Gerald Ford in 1976 and I prefer to be let alone, really. 
Um, in my research for this book, What Stays in Vegas, I've looked into many different kinds of companies that gather data. And I'm going to show you a picture now of the most surprising data gatherer that I've come across. But it's an image that very few people recognize. So this will be a test sort of of your, your, cultural, your past cultural awareness, in a sense. Um, can anyone recognize this man? This man was once considered a god of sorts, and this is a data gatherer, but here is who this is. This is Jimmy Page, the uh, lead guitarist of Led Zeppelin. And the reason why I have bring him up in the context of data gathering is that if you go to his website, which is jimmypage.com, just to go into the website beyond the initial splash page, he requires you to give him a lot of personal data. And he wants your first name, your last name, your gender, your email address, and your exact date of birth. So the point here is that if even Jimmy Page, a wild man of rock and roll from the 1970s, is gathering data about you, there are very few commercial entities that are not interested in doing the same kinds of things. Now, in exploring this whole world that I'm talking about of data gathering, I thought particularly interesting would be Las Vegas. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for this. First is that Las Vegas has so much money uh, at stake here that they've develop, developed very sophisticated loyalty programs that are means to gather information about customers. And I'm going to talk about that in some detail. Las Vegas also has um, a lot of access to interesting public records which are important for marketing. For example, more people are married in Las Vegas than anywhere else in the United States these kinds of things uh, are documents that data brokers and others can use to figure out potential customers. And then there's also more surveillance in the casinos in Las Vegas than anywhere else. Um, there might be 3,000 or 4,000 or even 5,000 cameras in a large um, casino. Now, in my book, I look at the largest casino company, which is Caesars. They have more than 50 casinos worldwide, and Caesars Palace is their most famous of the various uh, casinos that they have. And um, they have a very interesting leader there that's different from the kind of casino boss that you may know from uh, Hollywood films of the past. Uh, if, you think of who, if you think of bosses that come to mind from, from Las Vegas, you might think of Bugsy Siegel, or if any of you have seen the movie Casino uh, with Robert De Niro, he played a character based on Lefty Rosenthal, another mob-related kind of person. But by contrast, the boss or the CEO at Caesars, the world's largest casino company, is this man here, Gary Loveman. Gary Loveman is very different from those kinds of people. He um, is actually uh, lives in the Massachusetts area and commutes to Las Vegas. He has a PhD in mathematics from MIT, and then he taught at Harvard Business School as a junior professor. And um, as a junior professor, he began doing some consulting work for what was then Harris and has today been renamed Caesars. And um, what they were interested in is his concept of the lifetime value of customers. This is an idea, an article that he published at the time. And this concept is fairly simple. If you come to my pizzeria and you buy a slice of pizza, you're worth a dollar to me now. You're not a very valuable customer. But if you come week after week over the course of a lifetime, you're a valuable customer. So the point is, how do you get that, that kind of loyalty from a customer? This is the article that he wrote about this um, in it was uh, during his time at Harvard that he said, look, the lifetime value of a loyal customer can be astronomical. For example, the lifetime revenue stream from a loyal pizza eater can be $8,000, a Cadillac owner $332,000, and a corporate purchaser of commercial aircraft, literally billions of dollars. So in the casino world, they have this fairly big problem, and that is if you think of Las Vegas, there's a giant strip with hotels and casinos lining it, all offering fundamentally the exact same product. The slot machines are made by the same people, the table games are the same, the odds are the same. Now one place might have a singing gondolier, the other place has dancing fountains, but the core product is the same. So how do you get people to come to your place rather than somewhere else? So Gary Loveman's method and the consulting that he began to do all had to do with gathering data about customers to keep them coming back. Now, before I get to that, I want to tell you about how customer service used to work in Las Vegas many years ago. Um, 
in the olden days, Las Vegas was quite small, and you could know people by, by name uh, and recognize people more easily to single out the best customers to make them feel special. So I have the little picture back there about um, an episode of The Twilight Zone from 1960. And in this episode, a couple, Mr. and Mrs. Franklin Gibbs, win a prize to go to Las Vegas for the weekend. And as they arrive, the manager, Mr. Henderson, comes out and says, well, hello, Mrs. Gibbs. I'm really glad to see you. Is your room OK? Are you comfortable? Is there anything I can do for you? And Mrs. Gibbs says, you know, you make us feel important. Thank you very much, Mr. Henderson. And so that concept of making her feel special or important is what that whole customer service thing is about. The problem today, of course, is if you have 60,000 people coming through a casino, how can you figure out who to give that special attention to? Who's worthy of your time when you've got so much traffic coming in in a massive casino? And that's where the loyalty programs come in. Now, this picture here shows behind uh, loyalty programs as they once were. So these shows green stamps. So your parents or even your grandparents may have remembered you would go shopping and if you went to the grocery store and spent $100, you might get 100 green stamps and you would put them in books. And if you had enough stacks of books of green stamps, you could go and redeem them for a prize such as a toaster. Now, the problem from the business side was you didn't know anything about your customer until the day he or she arrived with a stack of books. And you would see, aha, this is an important customer. So the next innovation in this work comes with American Airlines in 1981 introduces the first airline loyalty program. And this, for the first time, allows them to know who are the important customers by name. Now, American Airlines had tried to surreptitiously gather information about people to see who is the important person going to London every week to give them the special service. But sometimes these important people were booking from the office, sometimes from home, and it was hard for them to tell who were the important people. Um, so they just devised this number, which is the frequent flyer number, which has now become a commonplace throughout many different kinds of industries. Now, in the context of Las Vegas, this is how it works. Um, oh, no, first I need to tell you one problem of, of the Las Vegas had in particular. For the airline industry, you, you had a centralized computer where you could, whatever you called to make the reservation, you just put the number. It was fairly easy to put the data in. The problem you had in Las Vegas is that you have thousands of slot machines in a casino, and each of them need a brain, in essence, to read the data um, from the card or the number about the people. So the innovation at the time, it was quite expensive to do this. It cost about $400, um, which made it very expensive to gather data about customers a few decades back. So this man is the guy who devised the brains that were put into the computers. This is John Akers. Now, it was costing about $400, and there was a big pressure to bring down the cost so they could put them on all machines to gather data about every customer. So he, one Christmas Eve, was wrapping gifts for his, present, uh, for his children, and he came across the following um, gift, which was once upon a time a cool toy. This is called a speak and spell. And, and back then, it was sort of miraculous that you could see a little screen and you could type it and it would, it would uh, tell you whether or not you spelled it correctly and it would show you the real wor world a real word, and it cost about $50. But it had this electronics, it had graphics, and so on. And he was amazed that they could do this for so cheaply. Uh, and he wanted to do a similar thing for the slot machine. So he flipped it upside down, he unscrewed it, and he, saw, he sort of had his eureka moment. Aha, uh -huh, I can actually do this for a slot machine. I see what they're up to here. So um, the next morning, in the John Akers household, there was one less gift under the tree, but the whole casino industry from there was revolutionized because the brains, in essence, were reading information about every customer that comes in. And this is how it works. You come into the casino, and you decide whether or not you want to join the loyalty program. Now, in Las Vegas, an overwhelming bulk of people do because they want the perks that, that you get. Um, and when you're signing up, you give your name, address, all sorts of personal information about yourself. Then at every turn, you're going to be sharing this card. If you're getting a meal, if you're gambling, if you're going to the spa, if you're renting a hotel room. So they're going to know pretty much everything that happens within the wall of the casino. And even the staff will be closely monitored. So these are two cocktail waitresses in a Caesars managed property in Cincinnati. Not only when they're checking in, but when they're getting drinks, what they're doing over the course of the shift. So there'll be vast data both about the people who are customers and the people in the back of the house. 
Now, the reason why people join is you want to avoid a scene like this. This is a line for the famous Bacchanalian buffet in Las Vegas at Caesar's Palace. It's a very famous restaurant considered one of the best all-you-can-eat places uh, where they have amazing crabs legs and chocolate cakes and all sorts of things. But on a day like this, a three-day weekend, that's quite a line. You could be there for a lot of time before you get into the, into the place. Now, if you were a valuable customer in their loyalty program, you would be able to go to the straight at front of the line and get immediate service. Uh, you would go to a counter like this. These are the most elite of the various members, seven stars members, and they will check into the hotel in a special desk, get into the restaurants, and so on. So that's why people agree to share their data in the, in the casino context. Now, having all of this data allows the manager or the host on the floor of the casino in very real time to figure out who's who and give them special service, to single out people. So they can see, aha, there's a valuable player over there. I'm going to say hello to this person. But before they do, they're going to study a little bit of information about them. And I'm going to show you what they can know about them in real time. So on a cell phone, they will see this following kind of information. So this will say, location UB01. That's over there. I know that that's that slot machine. And that's where Mr. John Smith is seated right now. I can see what tier he is in the loyalty program. Now, at Caesars, he's a seven-star member. That's the top of the line tier. There's several tiers, as you have with airline programs. So I know this guy's very important. He deserves my special attention. Then I know, um, then I know this year he has almost 100,000 points. That's the top line for next year. So he's continuing to spend a lot of money in my casino. Here's the dominant property, northern Kansas City. This is from Kansas City, so I know he's a local guy who comes to my local casino very often. Um, this is his typical spend per visit, $212. Now, in casino terminology, typical spend per visit, of course, means typical loss per visit. And um, here's his date of birth. And here's theoretically what he should have lost today, $145. He put in $1,450 into the slot machine, and he should have lost $145 because the machine keeps 10% of all the money that he puts in there by statistical odds. But he's having a good day today. He's actually down only $59 despite the odds. There's more information, however. Um, on his last trip, which was just a few days before when I visited here, he should have lost $563 according to the statistical odds. But in actuality, he lost $772. So he had a really poor day. You know that this guy is comfortable spending about $212 in one day. He lost $772. He's down some today. So before I go and say hello to Mr. Smith, I have all this knowledge in real time about him. And I can study other factors about him. I may know that he likes a certain kind of comedy club act or a certain kind of food or a certain kind of concert. And I may know that I have extra tickets to a concert tonight or there's a new chef in town. And considering that he's a valuable guy, I may come up to Mr. Smith and say, Mr. Smith, I would like to give you two tickets to dinner tonight. And he thinks this is a fantastic place. I'm having a great time. He's down nearly $1,000 in the last two days, but he's delighted because he's been given um, these little perks or benefits in, because they know about this data. So this is how casinos can use the data in real time. Now, as I explained, this is a voluntary choice in the casino context. You don't have to join the program. You can either join or gamble anonymously if you want. But if you do join, they're going to know everything that happens in the public sphere. They'll even know things such as what kind of drinks customers prefer, but uh, drinks are not always served in this manner in Las Vegas. Um, there are some things that people do not know, the casino does not know and does not want to know, and that are things such as what goes on in the bedrooms. And here's an example from that. This is an actual sign that I photographed in Las Vegas during my research. This sign says, the dress code for this party is naked. If you don't like to party naked, please check out the parties upstairs. Thank you. So, this is the kind of data that the casino does not gather because they cannot make money on this and it's not pertinent to their core business. Um, but it's something, everything else in the public spaces they do monitor and know stuff about. Other stuff they know comes from the video surveillance. And I've mentioned before that there are you know, 3,000 or more cameras. I was just recently in Macau, which is the world's largest casino capital, has way surpassed 
uh, Las Vegas, there might be 6,000 cameras in one of their casinos. And um, if you think about my original story, I told you that 10 Stasi agents followed around one guy, me, on one day. You don't have 3,000 people monitoring every camera all the time. You have five or six people in a back room watching the highlights. And this is what it looks like in the back of a casino. So this is one of the five people in a large casino who is on duty. And what he can see are the hallways where people are coming and going. So this is the front of the house where the guests are. This is the back of the house where the staff is going. Um, and these are like key card tables that he can follow the action. Um, so he can see a lot, and there are just hundreds of these, and they can call up whatever they want. Now, most of the action is pretty banal, and a lot of the data that I'm talking about or the personal information gathering can either be used for good or for things that are less good. In the context of the casino, you've left your bag here. You can't remember which, which, um, which slot machine you were at in the excitement about your victory or more, or more likely the disappointment of the loss. You've left. It's a busy casino. He can follow it back in time and figure out exactly where you were seated and take you to there. So there's certainly great things about this technology. Um, and of course, this kind of video surveillance technology is pretty commonplace throughout um, many different, uh, all, all sorts of different kind of environments. I think there's a class project at Harvard where they've counted um, they count for fun, they count how many video cameras they can find, and I think they found 800 cameras on Harvard campus. So the number has been steadily increasing every year. Uh, if, if any of you have idle time, you could do that on your campus as well and, and see how many cameras there might be that, that monitoring things. Now, another thing I want to talk about is the kind of data that customers can know, um, that the companies can know about customers in other contexts. Now, even if you uh, never go to a casino. What I've talked about is common in different companies. Disney would do the same thing to monitor its customers in a Disney world or a Disneyland. And many people are sending you offers based on what they think they know about you. And here's what a commercial data broker might have in a typical listing uh, on hundreds of millions of Americans. So this would show, for example, they would have your home information, uh, your telephone numbers, your email contacts, any professional licenses you have, perhaps genealogy information about you, court records, education, work information, and web profiles. Now, um, as I mentioned, there are these big data brokers whose names are unfamiliar to most Americans, and they have pretty extensive information about people, often even about intimate topics. And once a year, there's a big conference called the Direct Marketing Association Conference, where all these data brokers come and they sell and offer their different wares to the, to the people in the industry. So I went to a couple of these and I would go from table to table and I would say, show me what you have, what are your lists, what, what, what's going on here. And here's one list that I found interesting that I came across. This is the list of men with erectile dysfunction. So this is 1.7 million a man, a man that sells for $85 per thousand. So this is name, address, phone number, email address. So I said to them, this list is very interesting. Tell me more about this list. And they said, these men, they volunteered this information. And I'm thinking, you know, there's 1.7 million men on this list. I don't see even one guy volunteering this information, let alone 1.7 million men. So I said to them, let me buy 1,000 names. $85, I'll pay that gladly, and I will send a mail or an email to them, and I will ask the following question. I'll say, men, have you received any useful marketing offers related to your, your reported condition here? And secondly, did you know you were on this mailing list? And this company called T5 Healthy Living said, you know, this would be an immoral use of our data, and they refused. And this is kind of typical of a lot of the companies that gather data. They're extremely secretive about who they are and how they gather data. And even companies like Facebook, let's share it all. If you go to Facebook headquarters to enter the building, they require you to sign a non-disclosure agreement. I went there to meet someone, and they're like, sign here, which means you cannot tell anybody what you see in this building. And I'm like, no, 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 my very purpose of going in this building is to disclose everything that I find. So I was not allowed to go in. I had to meet the guy in the garden outside. So these companies are secretive about who they are and how they operate. Now, this one company in, in this one list in particular is just one of many kinds of medical lists that can be bought. 
So in this small print here, it says if you want a list of people with epilepsy or mental health issues, or you pick your ailment, they've got it, and they'll sell it to you. Now, you, you may say, well, maybe this is kind of out there, not uh, used by many prominent companies. Here's the kind of companies that use mailing lists like this, according to the website of this very data broker. And you have very famous ones like Procter & Gamble and eBay and uh, General Motors, Toyota, and so on. Here's another list that I came across. But before I show it to you, I want to ask uh, if anyone in this crowd has ever used a site called scholarships.com. Uh, yes, one, two, three, all right, so um, if you've used the site, there is a slight possibility that you will be on this mailing list, which is the list of high school students or former high school students who are gay. So here they're selling 236,000 names um, of bisexual orientation. And the way this, this is how scholarships.com works. There's two sides of the business. There's scholarships.com, and they say, we will help find you a scholarship for college. Now, you've got to tell us a lot about yourself for us to get this information. So tell us first who you are, where you live, what you're interested in, what you've studied, what does your parents do? And there's page after page, and they keep saying, the more you tell us, the more likely we will find uh, a scholarship suited to your, to your needs. And then it goes on, what about your sexual preference? What about your parents? Does anyone in your family have AIDS? And, and you're just giving this, and they say in the fine print, oh, we may share this information with our trusted partners. Well. Scholarships.com is free, but the trusted partners are the data broker wing over here, and that's where this mailing list is. So you may have some vague sense that they're gathering information. You may not know, though, that you are the pure product being sold over here by the data broker assembled into this, name, into this list and then and sold for $85 for 100 or whatever they sell it for. This one is actually $95 per thousand names is the price for this list in particular. This kind of information leads to the possibility of using personal information in ways that can be uh, less appropriate. Now, of course, in the casino example, a lot of people like the program because they get the free rooms, the free drinks, the free hospitality by being loyal customers. And you've seen that in whatever loyalty programs you, you are in. Um, but there are ways to use data that is pretty disadvantageous. And so this is what I wanted to talk about. In Las Vegas, this is a picture of a new museum opened a few years ago. The, celebrating the rich criminal past of Las Vegas, and it's the Museum of the Mob. And in the very first room you go into in the museum, there's the criminal lineup room, where you pretend that you're on a criminal lineup, your friends or relatives take photos, and everyone's laughing, it seems really funny um, that you're in this, in this lineup. But for 12 or 13 or 14 million Americans every year, it's no joke, These are the, that's the number of people who are actually arrested every year. Now, in recent years, some entrepreneurs have thought this is a good business to take these mug shots of people who are arrested and to put them on the internet or to make uh, commerce uh, about them. So in my book, there's a whole chapter about this one company called BustedMugShots.com. It started off as a magazine in Austin, Texas, that would put funny-looking photos from the week's arrests, and they would sell this in, in gas stations and convenience stores and so on. But the entrepreneur who set this up, a man called Kyle Prawl, thought, wait, I can do much better than one town. I can get millions of mugshots from across the United States. I can code them in a way that when you look for the name, this will appear prominently in the Google search. And then the ultimate twist of all of this was when you're horrified to see that your, your mugshot is there, and there are 75 million Americans in the FBI database of people who have been arrested, so it's a fair proportion of the overall population, you click on the photo and it says, oh, for $75 or for $100, you can remove this photo. So this is different than traditional extortion, which is I will do this to you unless you pay me now. He's already done it, so then you pay him to undo the damage. Now, here's one story that I uncovered uh, in my research. This is Paula Roy. She's a woman from South Florida. One day, mid-afternoon, a friend calls and says, uh, will you join me for lunch? She said, I already ate, but I'll join you. So she orders the small portion of lentils. When the bill comes, however, they charge her for the large portion of lentils. And she says, wait a minute, I ordered the small portion. But the restaurant said, no, 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 you got the large portion, so you're going to pay for the large portion. The difference in the bill was $3.86. 
And she said, no way, I'm going to pay the right amount. And so she left to the penny the exact change for the small portion of lentils, and she leaves the restaurant. As she leaves the restaurant, the owner calls the police, and they actually arrest this woman on the little used charge of defrauding innkeeper. And she's hauled off to prison. Her mugshot is taken, and she's five or six hours in prison. Then she's released, and within days, the case is dropped because using the criminal justice system to prosecute someone on a $3.86 charge is not an efficient use of criminal justice resources. Anyway, years pass from this incident. It appears that it's long forgotten. But then one day, she's looking for a job. Friend calls her up and says, have you Googled your name recently? And to her horror, she sees that her mugshot from this incident over $3.86 is up there thanks to bustedmugshots.com. Now, throughout my research, I've been interested, like, who are these people behind these businesses? How does it operate? I've showed you already one of them, Gary Loveman from, from Caesars, a well-known established company, traded on Wall Street and so on. Um, but who's the man behind Busted? In the book, I published these following six photographs, um, his six mugshots. So Kyle Prawl is a guy who grew up in a good, uh, in a good solid middle-class home. His father was a judge. He had all sorts of advantages in life, but he was bored by conventional business. And instead of going into finance and accounting, where he worked for several years, he quit those jobs and started up the mugshot business. Here's what Kyle Prawl looks like today. So this is one example of a business that you could use personal data in a way to, disadvent to uh, the disadvantageous um, impact on someone. Here's another twist of this business. This is a website called myx.com. So you break up with someone in your um, unhappiness about what happened. You post photos that you have that may be intimate or especially embarrassing. And when the person is horrified by the, the, the existence of these photos, they click on it, and for only $499, yes, US dollars, you can remove your image from this website. So you can think of all sorts of twists on this. You could have like drunkenidiot.com, and then like, you know, you could use this in many different ways. This is something that has been allowed, although there have been some state laws in the last year or two about uh, taking money for removal sites. And then this is sort of a variant of revenge porn. There's been some laws against this. Another kind of business that have flourished in the last couple of years are peak people lookup sites. So you may have recognized, if you look up an individual's name on the internet, sometimes you'll see Google ads run on the top. So you see this, this up here is the Google ad. Here's the actual thing you were looking for for Jeff Oaks. So this is one company, Instant Checkmate, that has been very successful in um, driving business to their site uh, every time for individual names. And so if you click on the ad, it will take you to this following page uh, where it will say this very ominous language. It says, please use caution when conducting a search to ensure all the information entered is accurate. Learning the truth about the history of your friends and family can be shocking. So please be cautious when using this tool. So of course, if it's shocking, you're clicking on there, and it's $20, you're happy to pay it, you want to know the shocking information. This is clever marketing propaganda by this company. Um, but they've also used advertising that is occasionally um, pr provocative, and it'll say things like, Latanya Smith, comma, arrested, and um, even when they don't have arrest records. So they've been very successful. But like many of these other companies in the data sphere, they're quite secretive about who they are and where they've come from. So on blog postings and on various information uh, that the company put out there, there was a name, Kristen Bright, saying, I'm the customer uh, relations director, I'm the spokesperson, I'm the such and such for Instant Checkmate. But when I tried to reach her by, by email, by phone, um, other means, I could never find her. She was not there, I don't know who she is, I, I don't know if she's in today. I began to suspect that uh, this woman wasn't a real woman, so I began the search for a mystery woman. Um, I had a single clue in my effort, and that was there was a Yelp page that had a thumbnail-sized picture of a woman, and it said, hi, I'm Kristen B. I'm the customer relations director at Instant Checkmate. So I thought it would be interesting, could I find this woman in the photo? And if I found a woman from the photo, how much about her life could I know just based on a single photo on the, on the internet? So I began cross-referencing data. I found from that photo, 
um, the little face of the woman, I found the bigger photo of her, which showed her face, and she was wearing a bikini, and she was sitting on a boat. There were other images I found on the internet. Some of them were uh, her with her family on Fourth of July or Father's Day. Others, though, were decidedly saucy images, kind of like sexy negligee. Some of them were topless, but they were homemade photos. Um, and she had a name, Anne, and the surname was a fake surname that she was using. And because it was a fake surname, it was hard to figure out exactly how I could find her. But I kept looking more and more, and eventually I found from that fake surname, or no, using the images, I found her with a man called Tom, saying, I'm, I'm Ann's husband, we're going to Jamaica this weekend. I had a few more clues about them. I kept searching on and on, and eventually, in a database, I found an email address belonging to a couple called Tom and Ann. Fortunately for my research, the couple had filed a bankruptcy petition, and in the bankruptcy petition were lots of clues about their personal life, including where they live, their contact numbers, um, and their debts. And their debts included $131 owed to Victoria's Secrets. And I thought, aha, uh -huh, a lot of those photos that I was looking at had these negligees and things like that. Could this be the same Anne and, and Tom, the husband? So the records had uh, where Anne worked, which was a school in California. I looked through the school records, found an old staff photo, and bingo, I was able to identify this Anne was the same Anne that I had been looking for. And so I called her up, and Tom answered the phone, and here's what he said. He said, back before, 10 years ago, when you put up pictures on the internet, there was total anonymity, but it's not like that anymore. You can see now, you put up a picture on the internet, and you get a guy from Harvard calling you up on your cell phone. So the story behind them is that they started putting up pictures in 2003 before the existence of Facebook. Um, Eventually, Anne began to attract admirers, and, and they would say, hmm, we'd like to see more photos of Anne. And Tom and Anne began to satisfy their public fans by putting up photos of her, including fairly saucy photos. Um, and I asked them, well, did you put up the photo for Instant Checkmate? Did you work for Instant Checkmate? They had no idea about Instant Checkmate. Their, her photo was just taken, put it on this Yelp page. The company of Instant Checkmate said they had no idea how to arrive there and said that they hadn't done it either. Um, the story I'm telling you about Tom and Ann is actually the PG version of the story. Uh, there's actually sort of the saucier R or X-rated version, but um, to, to get that story, you have to read the book perhaps over vacation. If you, uh, it is sort of an amusing, more detailed tale. But, um, and here's what Ann looks like today. But the real moral of the story, and why I've gone in some depth to tell you this, is that if you give a little bit of detail away, it's like having a single piece of a mosaic. You can't tell that much about them, but more and more pieces um, add more and more views, and eventually you can tell what the whole picture of the mosaic looks like. Um, so if you, sh if you buy a pair of pants on the internet, they know how big your waist is. If you subscribe to all the cable television channels and all the movies and the sports channels, and they know your waist size, and maybe they know something else, that translates to, you're a big fat guy sitting around watching television all the time, right? And does that mean, well, maybe the bank doesn't want to give you the same loan, or maybe the, the insurance company is a little more wary based on that pretty fragmentary information. And that's what the purpose of the story is, really, is, is the, the more you can know about someone. For companies, a lot of it is boiled down to this cartoon, which says, your call may be monitored, your internet searches may be recorded, your email may be scanned, your whereabouts may be tracked, your credit card purchases may be analyzed, and your most intimate personal details may be accumulated in order to serve you better. And this seems like sort of a joke, like all this gathering in order to serve you better, but you see this all the time. This is in Istanbul at a Turkish Airlines counter. Here's an uh, airline clerk, here's a passenger, and this little thing to the side caught my attention, which is this thing. It's a listening device, and above the listening device, it says the following. In order to improve our quality of service, your conversations are being recorded. So this is commonplace, started mostly in the United States, but commonplace now increasingly worldwide. Um, so how do you know who's gathering data and how it works? Of course, there are privacy policies, and um, they're often hard to figure out. So here's the size of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, 272 words. Here's the size of the privacy policy of a company called Zinch.com, which is related to educational stuff, more than 6,000 words. That's like a chapter in a book. That's a lot to read. 
Um, many of you may have received in the last week or two an email from Facebook saying, here's our new simplified privacy policy. Now, um, even those who study this kind of thing are like sort of baffled. Well, what's so simple about this? I mean, in reality, you'd have to spend a considerable amount of time figuring out what this is all about, right? There's nothing simple about it. You could, of course, have something like a nutrition label, which tells you if you care, here's what the fat is, sugar, whatever. Does the company gather data about you from somewhere else? Does it sell their data to other companies beyond? So Caesars, for example, in that casino example, they do not sell it outside the casino. So that's a factor. If you don't want to join, don't join. If you are comfortable Caesars having all that data I showed you, then join the program, but you know that they won't be selling it beyond. These are some general conclusions. Uh, personal data lives forever. So if you're sharing one piece of data on an, internet, on an internet site, it may be shared with other people in a way that can be aggregated by a data broker and used in different contexts. Um, personal data does not always portray or predict reality. So data brokers have lots of pieces of information that are wrong. I'm looking into now, um, data brokers seem very bad at figuring out who has died. So they're, off, they're sending out millions of pieces of, of mail a year to dead people which is very distressing to spouses to see like every time, especially around now in the Christmas season, to get solicitations to the dead men. They don't know that people have died in an accurate way. So um, they're not always on the ball about certain aspects. And I think in the long term, businesses dishonest about their personal practices will end up in ruin. You can fool people by doing all this kind of stuff, or you can be open about it. And I think those companies that are open about it will prosper. Now, Think about a lot of the services we use are free. So Facebook is free, Google is free. They could do a better job of saying, we're delighted you like Facebook, but please know we directly use your, advertise your information to target advertising as best we can. We don't sell it to other companies. That's what our policy is. They're not straightforward about what they're doing, and I think they could be much better about it. In the big picture, I think that so much of the technology stuff that has happened is a great improvement to everyone's life. There's nothing. Um, bad inherently about it. But in the development of business and the technology, there is this side effect of being able to know huge gobs of intimate information about people. And that's the unintended consequences. It's sort of like when you develop the car, it was a great revolution in transport more than 100 years ago, but people were then flying out of the car to injury and death. They didn't have seat belts. They didn't have safety protections. It took many, many decades, only into the 1960s when uh, seatbelts were mandatory in the United States. We sort of need this kind of review within the United States when it comes to personal data. Um, and as for your own data, I just encourage everyone to think about what they want to do for themselves. So if you want to share all your data and do whatever you want, that's fine with me, but just think about this system that I've described and then decide accordingly when, when and where you're comfortable sharing data. Um, other sites that are interesting about sharing data are dating sites because at a certain point in time you think, I really need to share this data to get a date or do whatever I want to, but that data could be out there for a long time, much more than this coming weekend or whatever your intended goal is. So with that, I was going to take some questions. These are my contacts and Twitter handle and um, related details and so on. But uh, thank you, and if there's questions and comments, please uh, let me know. Well, maybe you can run back and forth with <laughs> Mike, but... Uh... Is, is anyone completely at ease sharing every last scrap of detail about their life and thinks everything I've said doesn't make any sense because who cares, it doesn't matter? Is there like a total advocate for total openness? Is there anyone that's quite worried about what happens with their personal data and does take uh, measures so, so tell me what kind of things you do to protect your information and why. So you wouldn't go to jimmypage.com or you wouldn't sign up for that. And what, what do you do? Yeah. But, and what about you? Well, I mean, it's... You can say it's too late, but remember, you may have shared a lot of information in the last 
five years. But that's only your life up to then, right? And in many ways, your commercial lives are only now becoming interesting, right? Because you're not very valuable to people until you start earning money, right? And so the data that you generate from here on in is what's going to be important and interesting to consumer, to, to businesses. By the way, I haven't mentioned at all uh, the name of Edward Snowden. And my book is about the commercial data gathering. And the reason I look at that is that um, the government could know a huge amount about any one person if they were that inclined to do all the digging. But they don't have ongoing active dossiers about everybody. And that's what data brokers and many commercial companies have. So yes, what you've shared up to this point may be out there, but it changes rapidly over time. And so you, know, you may leave here and be a struggling artist and not be very valuable as a customer. Or you might be some big person on Wall Street and be very valuable. Where, where you go and how that develops will still be ongoing. So in the book, I talk about privacy measures you can take if you care about this stuff. Um, those are one of the things. Any other last uh, comments or observations? Otherwise, I thank you all for coming. Thank you.